loving and gentle Jesus, you have given us all that we need, and still we long to find rest for our weary souls. Help us to recover the childlike innocence and wonder at the marvels of your creation. Remind us of the beauty which is at the very core of our existence with you. When the world has beaten us down, fix our hearts on the promise you have made that you are gentle and humble in heart, and in you we will find rest for our souls. Help us to understand that in taking on your yoke, we will find the rest we so desperately seek, and bring us to the realization that though none of us is blameless in your sight, all of us are forgiven in your perfect love. Amen. Take my yoke upon you. Come and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. I will give you peace. I think it would be a safe bet that anyone present here this morning over the age of 10 has at some time or other in their lives felt weary, or that we have been carrying heavy burdens. That is one of the reasons that this passage from the author of Matthew's Gospel is so comforting to hear. In the right one version of our Eucharistic service from the Book of Common Prayer, just after the confession and absolution comes what is often referred to as the comfortable words, which begin with, hear the word of God to all who truly turn to God. Come to me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. The circumstances of that weariness or those burdens may be different for each of us. Perhaps it is a health concern for ourselves or a loved one, Perhaps a weariness under the financial burdens which grow larger and larger as our dollars seem to grow smaller and smaller. For me, the greatest burdens and the deepest weariness comes from those things which I impose upon myself. That is, the guilt and the shame I take on in the realization that my behaviors are not always what I want them to be and how often I fall short of the goals and expectations I have set for myself, or even that I have allowed others to set for me. This is the burden of sin, which the Apostle Paul explores in the letter to the early Christian community at Rome, from which we heard a portion this morning. Our ancestor in the faith, whom we have elevated to sainthood, comes down to our human level and identifies with us in our constant struggle to understand our own actions and discover why it is we do what we do not want to do, but do the very thing we hate. I can begin each day in grateful prayer, asking God to guide and guard me from the weaknesses of my spirit and still within five minutes from leaving my home, be caught up once again in my petty preoccupations and behaving less than Christ-like in my attitudes and reflections to my siblings in Christ who happen to cross my vehicle's path and don't meet my expectations of how they should be driving or walking or dressing or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Jesus, addresses the crowd this morning, establishing for them and for the scribes and Pharisees who lurk in the background, the differences between himself and the other blessed prophet of the time, his cousin John. 
Once again, as we heard in last week's lesson, the gentle teacher refers to the inherent value and innocent hearts of the children. That is, once again, radical and remarkable behavior for one who claims spiritual leadership in Jesus's time. Children, like women and slaves, were held in no great esteem or high social value in first century Palestinian society. They were property to be used to one's greatest economic advantage or ignored. Yet Jesus compares those of that generation to children who call out to others to come and join in the dance or join in the dirge and are once again ignored by those so filled with their heavy burdens and their world weariness. John comes proclaiming the value of fasting and repentance and is labeled a demon. Jesus comes and eats and drinks among them and is labeled a glutton and a drunkard. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Are you weak and heavy laden? Are you lonely and distressed? Come and bring your every longing. Come and I will give you rest. Oh, I will give. This is precisely what Jesus has come to liberate God's people from. This strict and almost impossible burden of living according to the law. The radical rabbi from Nazareth of Galilee knew the crushing and burdensome weight of living under the totalitarian law that had no room for mercy or compassion. Jesus took every opportunity possible to proclaim liberation from that burden by reducing the complexities and intricacies of the code of the Jewish law to its basic essence, love of God and love of neighbor. And love is seldom burdensome and rarely impossible. As Jesus is speaking to the crowd about the hypocrisy of the legalists of that age, he pauses and begins a prayer of thanksgiving to God for hiding these things from the wise and intelligent and revealing them to infants. I'm guessing many of you are aware of the story of the four or five year old girl who is discovered in the nursery leaning over the crib of her newborn sibling and whispering, tell me about God, because I'm forgetting. At first glance, Jesus' words in the author of Matthew's 11th chapter seem to invite us to set aside the deepest burdens of our lives. Christ's words seem to be an invitation to set aside the stress we face, emotional, physical, vocational, and perhaps even financial. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, including the 20 somethings who can't get a job, the retirees who work at McDonald's or greet at the doors of Walmart to pay for health insurance, the teenagers burdened by anxiety, isolation, and fear, come to me, and I will give you rest. What's not to like about that offer? Come and lay down your burdens. Jesus will do the heavy lifting. Yet, as Shelley Best notes in Feasting on the Gospels, the text does not imply Jesus is going to take the heavy weight away. Our loans are not going to be automatically forgiven. Our payments will still need to be made. Here, Jesus is instead instructing the disciples on the deeper wisdom of God. 
and calls the disciples to take upon themselves the yoke of God's instruction. In the wisdom of God, who knows our deepest needs, our spirit shall be refreshed as we are faithfully yoked to Jesus. It's a different weight, not an oppressive burden, but one that is gentle and light. It is a yoke that instructs us in the pilgrim way of life. It is a yoke that is carved and shaved by the carpenter's son to fit our shoulders. Further, the language instills, instills in us a reminder, <coughs> excuse me, of the deepest intimacy Jesus shared with God. By taking on Jesus' yoke, we are drawn into relationship with God in order to discover a new way of life. Jesus continues to be Emmanuel, God with us. The one whose deepest love for the world shoulders and shares our deepest burdens. Come and bring your sorrows, lay them at my feet. Bring to me your burdens, I will set you free. I think the lesson, hidden not so subtly in this passage, is that we must return to that point of innocence and trust that we had as infants if we are to grasp the full understanding of God's wisdom revealed in the teachings of the Christ. The implication here is that anyone wanting to live the Christian life had better pay attention to young children. They are in on the secret. The little ones have the advantage first of being teachable. Secondly, they have the uncanny ability to cut to the heart of the matter. And finally, they live by trust. The celebrated Italian educator Maria Montessori based her educational theory on the concept that every young child has an absorbent mind. They learn all sorts of things every moment, <clears throat> similar to a sponge as it soaks up water. Babies enter this world utterly open to learning and anyone who is around them can testify to how much each of them takes in. Children also possess the gift of cutting to the heart of the matter. They seem to be able to get to the deeper issue and announce it with simplicity and candor. They and other people like them make the greatest philosophers and the best theologians. One of my nephews once drew a picture for me and for years it hung on my bedroom door. It was a simple drawing of a dandelion, and underneath scribbled in back-facing letter were the words, I wish the world knew peace. Children cut to the heart of things. They find their way directly to the center. Children live by trust. They have to trust. They have to trust others to get them through. They could, do, they could hardly do otherwise because they lack power. What they do have is love. Sometimes they show the rest of us what it means to trust because there are times when we lack power too. Another story is told of the value in the innocence of the childlike versus the surety of the wise and intelligent. Young Andy was asked by his parents if he would consider donating blood to help his critically ill brother. Without much thought or deliberation, 
cheerfully agreed. After the blood was drawn, looking up at his parents with faith-filled eyes, asked, when will I die? Andy thought that that gift given would mean death, yet trusted that somehow things would turn out right. Take my yoke upon you. Come and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. I will give you peace. So what of us who are perhaps a bit distant from our own infancies and childhoods. I think that perhaps we can approach Jesus with a similar question, as did the wise and intelligent political religious leader Nicodemus, who came to the teacher in the dark of night and asked if anyone could be born after becoming old, whether anyone could enter a second time into the mother's womb and begin anew. We have our answer in the scripture, tradition, and reason of our Anglican Christian heritage. We have all been baptized into the death of Christ so that we too can share in the resurrection of Christ, dead to sin and alive to new life. This is what Paul proclaims in the previous chapter of the letter to the early believers at Rome. This is what Jesus tells Nicodemus in response to the questions posed in that story from the author of John's account of the good news, that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Holy Spirit. So here's the good news for us, folks. We've been born of water and the Holy Spirit. We've been sealed and marked as Christ's own forever. When the burdens of our sins and the yoke of our failings become too heavy to bear, we have the words of our Savior spoken with such power and hope. Come to me. All you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen. Mm -hmm.